Good talk. Speaking of good talks, we have our very own <laughs> Laurel Byers here who is going to talk to you about blazing your own trail in your career. <laughs> Ring it up for Laurel.
insert big company here, designer. It should be, I want to be a designer that's blah, 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 blah. So you kind of like break down what you want to do and how you want to help people. All right, so there are a vast amount of jobs out there. There are big companies, plus consumer app and established teams, but there's a lot past that. There's small companies and startups, there's enterprise apps, there's B2B apps, there's internal tooling, and then there's small teams, there's teams of one, and there's teams where you're literally the first designer a company has ever hired. And that sounds really scary, but it can hold a lot of opportunities. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I currently work at a small company. Um, it's called Nianza, it's in Palo Alto. And we work on a non-consumer app that is focused on IT teams that helps monitor their uh, the health and wi uh, health of their Wi-Fi. And then I work on a tiny team. It's me, and it's me. So <laughs> very small. <laughs> um, so let's dive into tiny teams. Or tiny teams. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong wanting to work on a really big design team. I think you can be really fun. You can start to grow a lot. You can make a lot of great friends, which I have a few here still. <laughs> still. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the reality is not every opportunity out there is going to have an established design team that's big and robust. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities where it's just you, one other designer, or maybe just you. But the thing that can come with this is unlikely partnerships. So instead of relying on the design team that you have established already at these um, tiny teams, you start to branch out and like exit your design cave and start talking to the cross-functional team members that you should be involving in your process already. But in, um, in terms of the tiny team, it kind of forces you to do that a lot more than if you can just rest on your laurels, not trying to bring my name into this, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and just let the design team that's already established kind of roll with the punches, right? Uh, the next benefit is you get to establish design ops. And what I mean by design ops is um, setting up efficiencies at a company to help generate more consistent work. So this might be through design principles, workflows, tools, governance, infrastructure. Um, and you're not going to have like an official design ops person there. However, it's a mindset. And if you want to go into a big company, this stuff might already be established for you, which is great if that's what you want to work with. However, if you want to try different applications, try different processes, um, expand you know, the idea of what design principles are at your company. If you do this on a tiny team where those things haven't been established, this is your chance to be able to do that. And then lastly, um, it allows you to use the community. So I'm not gonna lie, being a sole designer is a little bit lonely. Um, you, you're not you know, connecting with a designer every day and being able to talk to them. However, it kind of forces you to go out into the community. So things like this, right? So you're going to start going to more meetups, you're going to start um, being part of way to these Slack channels like I am, <laughs> and you're going to start maybe participating more with uh, Medium articles or um, Dribbble or uh, Behance, any of those things will start, uh, you'll start being motivated to do that stuff more. All right, so let's talk about non-consumer apps. So we all know what consumer apps are, well maybe, but just recap, they're the ones on your phone basically, and you know a lot of people use them all around the world. But then there's a whole other world of non-consumer apps. So this could be software as a service, um, business to business, internal tooling, um, things like that. And the cool thing is there's a lot of job options out there with this. And if you're only looking for a consumer app product to work on, you're cutting out like, I don't have a legit stat, but like 50% of the jobs out there. Um, so by opening up your mind and, and looking at all the other options out there, you're going to already broaden the scope of the jobs that you can uh, apply to. Please, water. Talking so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> There's a road that goes to an island. <laughs> There's a road that goes to an island. It's an SNL joke. Never mind. Um, all right, so the next thing is uh, with Neither working road on non-consumer apps is that it's um, very complex problems. And this might sound kind of scary. Like, oh, why would I want to work with something super complex? But it's, it's a great challenge. Um, and I think it's a great thing to, to learn early on in your career. So if you do take a non-consumer app, you're going to be faced with more elaborate systems that may be relying on other things um, within the application. And then also you're just dealing with bigger technolog technological challenges uh, that take more than just a designer to figure out. And again, going back to the cross-functional team stuff, that's just something you need to learn as a designer to be able to do. And working on really complex problems on a non-consumer app is going to kind of propel you to do that. All right. Uh, next is pushing past your assumptions. So no one's probably going to admit to this, 
but we've all made that little you know mistake of being like, well, I'm kind of the user, so I'm gonna make it look like this. But when you're working on a non-consumer app, this forces you that you can't have that perception because you're usually there's no way you can connect with the user. I again work for a company that makes an IT app. I do not know anything about Wi-Fi. I do not know anything about Wi-Fi architecture. And therefore, I go out and I ask deeper questions and I investigate more um, as to what they need, what their problems are, what uh, the solutions are for that kind of stuff. So it pushes you past your assumptions in that way. And then lastly, with non-consumer apps, um, it allows you to share new learnings. So we, I, at least me, I read way too many medium articles and vision articles out there. And what I've noticed is they're all very consumer facing, which is great, you can learn a lot from them. However, non-consumer apps, they're not the same. There's a lot of standards that are different and not enough people are writing about them. And if you're new to design, you might get confused and think that those consumer standards transfer over to non-consumer apps. Um, so what we need to do is fill that gap. We need more people writing articles out there and sharing case studies and information that they've learned um, about non-consumer apps to fill that gap and not add to the pile of oversaturated articles about consumer-facing products. All right. And lastly, for these unconventional opportunities, and my favorite section, <laughs> is uh, small companies and startups. So what I love about working at a small company is that there are no silos, and this is in two different ways. So there's no silos between teams. I'm gonna talk about cross-functional teams a lot here. Um, there's no silos between them. Uh, because we're all in one location, um, because it's just a small company by nature, I don't have to deal with running across campus or trying to connect with someone who's around, um, who's around the world. Um, and then the second part of this is that there's no silos in your work. A lot of times when you're a new designer at a big company, you're tasked with a very um, small, defined um, problem. And with a small company, you're tasked with the whole problem. So you get to learn and experiment in a very holistic view of the products, and I personally really enjoy that. Um, next, you need lightning speed. Um, so of course you just need to be a fast um, iterator with, with design in general. Um, but I think when you're at a small company, or at least at startups, it's really imperative for you to work fast for two reasons um, that are benefits. <laughs> uh, because there are less tiers of approval, so it's uh, you don't have the hierarchy that you would at bigger companies, so things just um, get approved a lot faster. And then the second thing is that uh, you want to get things out to market faster. You want to get those MVP products out. Sorry, that's saying products way. <laughs> MVP piece. <laughs> um, you want to get those products out faster and start seeing if it resonates with users. So that means you're going to be iterating a lot faster and also getting out of your head a lot more. Because I know all those designers who can really think, overthink things way too much. And being a small company allows you to work on that muscle and not overthink. Um, next is you learn about the business. So, of course, you're gonna learn about the business at any job. However, when it's a small company or a startup, you are more invested in the success of the, of the business. You're gonna see your work have more impact on the business more immediately and for its uh, you know, future. So this means you're gonna be more involved in meetings and communications that might not be involved with design, but do allow you to learn about all the other stuff that happens at a company, which in turn makes you a better, well-rounded designer. Next is Misha, teach you person. So speaking of those well-rounded skills, um, what I love about working in a small company is that you wear many hats. You're involved with the entire life cycle of a product. And a lot of times at a larger company, again, you're, um, you're, you're put into a very specialized um, section of a product. And if that's what you want to do, if you want to specialize in something, that's, that's great. However, if you want to work through the entire product and own the whole thing, being in a small company allows you to be able to do that. Another great thing about it is if you're still trying to figure out what you want to specialize in, you get to go experiment with all the different steps and see what you're good at, what you're bad at, and what you want to pursue after. And then lastly, but I think most importantly, um, one of the best benefits about working at a small company or a startup is that you get to own design. Decisions that you make, again, they impact the company a lot more, and this is your opportunity to define um, what design is there? A lot of these companies, they don't necessarily understand that design is more than just making something visually pretty. I think we've all faced that problem before. Um, but this is your chance to actually change that. And a way to do that is through um, assessing the design maturity of the company. 
So this is envisions the new design frontier report. This is one of the um, visualizations that they had, but I found it really fascinating. So what's being shown here is the, um, the bottom, the more adoption of design uh, equals the more benefits from design. And there's, there's five levels. So with the first one down here, it's 41% of companies. That's a pretty big number. Oh, I can use a, I can use this thing. So exciting. <laughs> um, and this is the producer level. So this level is doing, it, it is actually just making things nice uh, looking, basically, and increasing usability. But as you go up the ladder of success here, uh, to visionaries, that's companies like Airbnb and Lyft. Um, and they're doing more strategic thinking and trend setting and, and a broader array of analytics that allow you to design more specifically um, and improve the application and therefore the benefits of the company increase. But the coolest thing that I liked about this level five is that there was no relation to, um, to large teams. So what that means is you could be a small team, you could be in a small company, and you can still bring the company up in design maturity to that level if you, if you, if you go about it the right way. All right, that was a lot. I'm gonna have a sip while you enjoy this great gift. <laughs> Who doesn't like that, right? I'm so mind blown. There's so many opportunities out there. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I really like taking screenshots and making lists of things. So uh, these are all the points we just went over about uh, the benefits of tiny teams, non consumer apps, and small companies. So I'll just leave this up for a moment. Take your screenshots now. I'll show the deck to you later. So you don't have to, but. All right. So let's move on to the next section. Um, the skills you need to succeed um, at these jobs, at these unconventional jobs that are out there, uh, but also any job, especially nowadays. And to back me up on this, 100% um, of people managers agree by having a diverse skill set that includes both hard and soft skills is the best way to stand out for the candidates. Um, so, let's talk about soft skills. So hard skills, technical skills, these are the skills um, that kind of make you like a defined designer on a resume. You know how to prototype, and you know how to um, do visuals and user research. Um, but soft skills are, are people skills. How do you communicate with others? How do you work with others? And what I think those all add up to is being a great facilitator. And this is a hot word right now. You've probably heard this a lot. Um, but being a great facilitator is um, what I think uh, involves collaboration, leadership, and introspective skills, which are all like broad ideas of, of uh, soft skills, essentially. So let's dive into each one of these. So collaboration is cool. Don't want to do that dance. So design is a team sport. And I don't mean just other designers. I mean literally everyone at your company. You should be trying to involve and teach about design. And you do this through forming alliances. So this means you need to befriend the PMs and the engineers and the QA and the customer success and the marketing teams. Get to know them, not just on a transactional level from meeting to meeting, but also as just human beings. So it's pretty basic and understandable, right? <laughs> um, so these opportunities, by befriending them and getting them more involved in the design process, you're gonna start elevating the US ideals uh, throughout the company because they're gonna start being more empathetic and understanding what your purpose is. Next is have transparency. I think a lot of times people hide their process, they wait to the very end, and then they're like, why is, why is this wrong? I don't understand. Um, and that's because you're not bringing people along with you on the journey. And you avoid this by bringing them early, um, early and uh, getting feedback from them often, of course, but also just not hiding the process of design. Explain the steps that you're going through to get to the solution and why you don't want to jump to the solution so soon. So now that you're bringing people more into your meetings and you're involving them more in the work that you're doing, you're going to be taking up more of their time, right? So you want to be, of course, respectful of their time. People are very busy. They're always having meetings. They always have something better to do. And if they don't understand the impact that they're going to make on the product, they're not going to find their inclusion in these meetings valuable. So by being organized, and having a plan, having the questions you want to ask, knowing the specific feedback that you want from them is going to show that you respect their time and therefore they will respect yours and they'll start to understand um, why their input is so important. And then lastly for collaboration, I think it's really important to be practical. 
And that might seem straightforward, but you will find that a lot of people fight for design early on and don't consider the business or technical uh, limitations of things. So what I'm saying is you need to be very flexible and practical and adaptable with the other teams and make sure that whatever you're designing is considerate of all the other factors because it's not just about design. All right. Let me have some more water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fast talker, so I will probably do that. Um, okay, so here's a quote. <laughs> um, the most valuable role for design to play is influencing the business, not just the product. And I think uh, the reason I brought this up is because I think design isn't just about the product anymore. You need to change the mindset of the company to truly make impact. Um, and the way you do that is through leadership. And at this point, you might be like, well, I don't have a leadership role. So I don't know how I'm going to be able to make any impact in a company if I don't have the title behind me. Um, and I thought that same way for a very long time. And then I watched way too many TED Talks. And um, this guy named uh, Simon Snack, who does plenty of them, I suggest you go watch them, um, he had a great quote. Leadership is a choice, it's not a rank. And when I let that set in, I started to realize that I was already doing things that were leadership qualities and that were changing the perception of design at my company. And you can do that too. And the way you do it is through being a guide. So you need to lead by example. And you need to be a guide, which is essentially facilitation. But when I think of being a guide, I think of a uh, picture going on a tour bus. And you're, you're the, the tour guide. guide. So everyone's getting in the bus, and you're like, all right, guys, we're going to go learn about design. This is the project we're learning. <laughs> and you just go along, and you're showing them the sights, and you're making jokes, and you're all laughing together and getting along. And then they all get off the bus, and they're like, wow, what a great experience. I learned so much. What an awesome product we made together. Um, so it's your job to be that guy, to be that enthusiast, and be encouraging and inspiring and make people feel safe enough to do um, risky things, like give their creative input. All right, next, you need to take the initiative. So, especially in these small companies, or these small teams, um, that maybe you're the first designer there, they never have one. They might not know what they need from a designer. So it's up to you to bring those concepts up to them. So if you see the need for a design system, or if you see a need to improve a flow in the application, it's up to you to bring that up and show them why. Maybe it won't be picked up in the roadmap right away. However, by taking the initiative, you're gonna be flexing that muscle. You're gonna show um, your ambition and your motivation and like what you want for the company. All right, next is more questions, less ego. So a lot of times early on in our careers, and maybe no one wants to admit to this, but we all get very defensive about our work. We think it's perfect and then we get feedback and realize it's not. Um, so <laughs> you, the problem there is that you're too attached to your work. And I think something really important to learn, and what you do through time, but if you can you know, rest it now, this will help you even more, is that the goal for your designs is to make a product that helps people. It's not for you to be right. So as soon as you start detaching yourself from your work, and when someone gives you negative feedback, instead of defending and deflecting, um, examine and engage. Lean into the problem. Try to understand more and use that emotional intelligence to to have active listening and be patient and truly understand why the person doesn't agree with what you're presenting. Next is be assertive and be kind. So a lot of times people think of being assertive and being kind are like the opposite spectrums. Uh, they can't possibly mix, but just doesn't, that's not, that doesn't work that way. Um, but I beg to differ, I think there's a fair balance. So what I'm saying is um, basically be confident in what you're presenting and what you're showing people but also be wise enough to know that they also have an opinion. And they, even though they're not a designer, they might know better than what you decided on, right? So again, going back to having that emotional uh, intelligence and really being sure that you're open and aware that other people have opinions and they might be um, better thought out than yours is a really imperative uh, skill to learn. But also be nice while you do it. <laughs> Side note. <laughs> All right. So being able to collaborate and lead effectively, you need to look inward and be introspective, right? So you need to be able to ask yourself, what's there to do it? <laughs> who am I? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but how you, how you figure out who you are is by um, growing your self-awareness. And this can be really hard at first, especially if you're right out of school. 
um, because you don't know what you're good at, what you're bad at. You're just kind of, you're just kind of like, help me. Um, and the way that you uh, attack that is by asking for feedback. So those people's, uh, those people's, the people that you made um, alliances with earlier, that you partner with, and now that you trust. Asking them for feedback, not just on the work that you're presenting, but how you're presenting it, is going to help you grow into a much better, well-rounded designer, and you'll know what you're good at, what you're bad at, and what you need to improve on. Next is self-advocacy. So, this is a fun word to say. Um, it's one's belief in one's ability to um, be able to do a specific thing or accomplish a certain task. So, basically, it's just being confident in what you're skilled at. And people, there's been a lot of studies about this, and I have a link at the end of the, um, of the presentation, you can watch a whole video on it. Uh, but essentially, um, people with self-efficacy, it's so hard to say, <laughs> um, they set their sights higher. And they don't, uh, they don't allow uh, the fear of failure to paralyze them in what they're doing. So basically, accepting that failure is just part of, part of the game, and uh, acknowledging it and moving forward, uh, no matter what, is gonna help you uh, propel yourself forward and make an impact in a company. And then that kind of ties with a growth mindset. So a growth mindset is a love of learning. Um, I think the best way to explain what this feels like inside is when you start a new job and you're super excited to be there and they're telling you like something to do, so your task is that you do it, and then they come over and they give you feedback, and it's like a little positive, a little negative, um, but you're just like, yeah, of course, I knew, I get it, I'm learning things right now, this is fine. That's a growth mindset, and now the trick is capturing that and being consistent with that for the rest of your career, which is really <laughs> um, So one thing to note on that is there's highs and there's lows. You're gonna go through emotional waves. Um, you're gonna feel really good about yourself at times, and then other times you're gonna you're going to feel terrible about yourself. But if you keep resetting your mindsets, being like, no, every opportunity is me growing and getting past something and evolving uh, as a human and as a designer, I will just make you better off and happier as a designer. Yeah. And lastly, um, authenticity and vulnerability. So you have to let go of who you think you are to be who you truly are. And the way to do that is to start forming true connections and being courageous about who you are inside. So don't be afraid of being who you are. Now I am. <laughs> don't be afraid of being yourself. Um, if you try to be someone else, it's going to be very transparent, and people are not going to trust you. And along with that is vulnerability. So you don't have to have it all figured out. I wish someone told me this early on. Um, you don't have to be perfect, and you don't have to have all the answers, ever, no matter where you are in your career. And it's really refreshing in the workplace to hear uh, that I don't know, and not enough people say that. So as designers, I think it's the perfect catalyst and um, role to be able to be that vulnerable and authentic person that brings people into the design process and shows why it's such a, a wonderful, open, and creative um, workplace to be in. And if you start being vulnerable, that leads to people trusting you more, and that has a ripple effect throughout the company. And here's that slide again for everything I just talked about. <laughs> All right. So, a lot of times we approach our career success in terms of how cool of a company we can work for and how much we know about design. And we miss out on these other when we miss out on those opportunities, we beat ourselves up about it, which is just very sad. So, I hope today you realize that it isn't fair to you, and it isn't fair to your growth, and it isn't it just isn't true. Um, go take these unconventional opportunities. See what you can learn from them. Uh, see what you, how you can grow as a designer and not be stuck on this pedigree bias of um, wanting to work at a fancy company just because of the name. And when you start doing this, if you let go of the conventional way of thinking about success and be a trailblazer of your own path, you'll realize you can have more growth and impact than you thought imaginable. Thank you.